Welcome to the Swisspreneur Show, a podcast about startup stories and hands-on learnings from experienced entrepreneurs. My name is Sylvan, and I will be your host. Swisspreneur is back in Zurich and is meeting with Monique Morrow, the president of the Vetri Foundation. Vetri is a platform that focuses on the management and control of data and privacy, and Monique is an incredibly fast thinker and has been recognized by Forbes as one of their top 50 women in tech globally. We meet at Trustquare, a community and co-working space in the heart of Zurich, focusing on blockchain companies. The offices are spacious and extend over several floors. There is a beautiful metaphor behind it too. The building used to be home of a traditional bank, but today it's filled with startups working on the next big shift to challenge current traditions and establish new standards. This mix of creatives, technology startups and corporate innovation was really fantastic to see. After a guided tour of the space by Monique, we sit down in the conference room and start with the interview. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SPB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at spbstartup.com. Monique, a very warm welcome to the Swisspreneur Show. It's great to have you here today. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's a pleasure to be here. We are here in Trust Square in the heart of Zurich. Um, and it used to be a bank uh, offices, basically. Now it's all filled with promising startups with the blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. And looking back in your career in January 2017, you left your role as a CTO at Cisco, a probably pretty well-paid job at the well-known corporate company. Why did you decide to leave and jump into this new adventure? I think because um, I felt that I wasn't growing anymore. That's number one. When you're too comfortable in a position, uh, it's always a, a, a red flag to, to, to jump. And furthermore, I actually got very hooked into what was happening in the blockchain space. And that was also a, a, a great opportunity to really go into you know, understanding what blockchain is all about, um, understanding its use cases, and also establishing a, a nonprofit organization that's based here in Switzerland, the Humanized Internet. Having said that, I have very great, wonderful colleagues in, in, um, at Cisco. It's a, it's a super company. I think the lesson learned from this is that uh, when you're too comfortable, um, you either will have to jump or you will be forced to jump. So in my case, I, I wanted to jump. Sound, sounds great. And then the same year, you got involved with Vetri, a project, and today also a foundation that focuses on personal data management. So why was 2017 the right timing to get involved in this space? And why was Vetri the right project to choose? So, I mean, well, let's take a, a step back further. I had uh, also met Daniel Gasteiger, who was the president of Procevis.ch, which is really focused on e-government as a service. So that's what mm -hmm. Procevis does. And he actually had asked me to be a member of his advisory board at the time, which I thought was was really wonderful because to understand how you can use this technology to create sort of a an e-government as a service model. Um, from there came the um, opportunity to, to deal with Vetri itself. Vetri is actually a management tool. Let's just put that out as a management tool. We're talking about Web 3.0. But the foundation itself is looking at how we take, it's a nonprofit, how do we use that management tool to actually create, um, uh, create a frictionless exchange between data owners and data consumers? Uh, further to be stated is that um, Procevis had actually had undergone at the time, uh, during that time, 2017, thereabouts, 2018, a a successful in an in initial coin offering, uh, which a uh, percentage of the uh, coins were actually allocated to the founding of the foundation. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to address sort of the idea or the problem that you actually solve with the Vetri Foundation. In your keynote presentation at the Red Bull Basement Festival, you basically said, um, there are 75% of the consumers that believe that companies do not take the protection of their data very seriously. That's correct. So what problem do you actually solve in that regard with the with Vetri and how do you address this? Sure, and that, that uh, quote is actually from a Gemalto Research um, uh, founding. First and foremost, what is happening is that what we see is that today, 
every day is a breach. When data is centralized, it's always a breach and it's getting worse and worse. Uh, and, and so you have this correlation between data ownership or some level of data ownership and privacy and security. So those are the, the three areas that we have to care about. Uh, what we find, uh, the reason why it's very important, what is important about Fetri is that it does offer that frictionless exchange between the data owner and the data uh, consumer. A consumer could be an enterprise, for example. Mm -hmm. And what we want to be able to do as an industry is how do we actually um, standardize on fair data or fair treatment of data? So as a tenant, uh, we need to put data ownership back into the hands of the consumer, uh, basically. It's no longer a business-to-business -business model. It's, a biz it's really the consumer that has to care about uh, the data. And what we found in the Red Bull Basement um, Conference itself and also in, in more recent conferences, especially I was at uh, ADA in Berlin, is that uh, people do care about their data. They care about their data. The question is how could they manage their data in such a way that uh, they're a little bit more in control. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, one of your core beliefs is the self-sovereign identity. Can you quickly walk us through what that actually means and why this is so important for the Vectory Foundation? Right, so self-sovereign identity is putting the uh, data owner in the middle. It's a well-known uh, term. It's uh, quite uh, standardized. If you can look at W3C or sovereign, even what we're doing at Vectory. So data um, is, you are the owner of your data, it's portable uh, to you, uh, it's, it's immutable. And what I think is more important is that you are selectively disclosing what you want to uh, disclose. And being able, I think that that uh, selective disclosure process is really important because you are able to control, and I'll put that in quotes, where your data goes to. And, you know, um, and this is an, a question about transparency. So. Self-sovereign uh, identity is, is one of the areas that, uh, it's a principal area that the Vetri Foundation is uh, quite focused on. What I think is interesting is that the industry is trying to get its hands around uh, self-sovereign identity. Uh, we thought, it's commonly called SSI, we thought it would be a couple of years away. It's actually right in front of us. And at the same time, I can also imagine, you know, there are very big players like Google or Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. that actually make a lot of money with the personal data of their users. They do. So they do. And so here's the thing. This is the uh, egregious uh, situation or the reality that we live in is that we're metadata. We're data of data of data. So congratulations on being meta metadata today. And, um, you know, you are a product. Uh, and so the question is, well, if you're a product, why not? Um, why can I not actually be, have a re remuneration scheme actually for uh, exchange of my data and be paid for it? So, um, you know, the thing of it is, is that uh, it, I know this can be sound controversial today, but it is important now that uh, consumers be part of that uh, ecosystem and be in the middle of the ecosystem. So, uh, you know, they have been making lots and lots and lots of money. And um, there's, uh, you know, some po people call this uh, a, a form of surveillance capitalism mm -hmm. at uh, some level. Uh, the thing of it is, is that uh, even quite recently at the F8 uh, Developers Congress, uh, Conference, uh, this, which is the Facebook Developers Conference this past year, every every keynote speech commenced with privacy is is certainly important, you know. And so why is that? This is the person who basically said uh, that privacy was dead and now people care about privacy. So we're, we're struggling in the industry with this governance model. Who is managing whom? And so, um, you know, we have, uh, people have actually made, monetized us. And so the importance here of what we're doing in the Fetri Foundation is that put, putting you in the middle of that. And we receive no, uh, we're not, we're not making money at it at, at all. Uh, in fact, that's not our model. Our model is to get, have the, have the owner and or, and or the, uh, the, either the consumer or the owner actually be part of that process. And so that's why we call it frictionless. And for us, as, as long as you're using valid coins, it's a sort of ga gamification. Mm -hmm. You know, you're actually stimulating that process more and more. Is that also the way that you actually want to attract the big companies to also join in on that journey and to move them away from owning that personal data in a private sector? and really giving access back to the people and putting them into the center. I, I think that it may be a bit late for the big companies to want to, I think 
perhaps what we need to do with the big companies or the bigger companies to, is to look at how we standardize on something called fair data or fair treatment of data, mm -hmm. insofar as that we know that the source of the data is is clean or, or known, right? And that's that's the important part of it. It would be great to have an ecosystem of companies to come together, but most importantly, what we what we have to be careful about is going back to the centralization model. So we have to live in sort of this hybrid, what is centralized and what is decentralized. And uh, the, the better way to frame this conversation is to say or suggest that we have a, a trust deficit. And so how do we actually address the trust uh, deficit? What are the reme uh, remediation methods to go forward in addressing this trust deficit? And that is actually to put you know, the data back to the consumer and having the consumer decide, particularly over the owner, the owner specifically, well, how he or she should have uh, should uh, selectively share the data and what kinds of monetization schemes that they're interested in, particularly on, in categories. And so with Vetri, we're looking at categories. It's market research or it could be marketing per se. So you can decide in, a, in, an, in an analogy is how you control your spam filter. And so you can say, I'm interested in, in having a conversation around maybe filling out research around uh, healthcare or around uh, hotels and so on and, and so on, insofar and you're getting valid coins insofar that you're able to control where that data goes. And in what way would you predict a, a shift in business model for the big companies like Facebook, Google again? Do they become less relevant in the future if the whole model actually works and is applied, or no, how does I mean, that change? And I, and I should be transparent because I have very close colleagues in all of these companies, and they're very concerned about what's happening. Uh, and so, uh, they, this, these are companies that, base, uh, particularly one, who basically said, "Do no evil or do no harm." I think they've swayed a love away from "do no evil, or do no harm." We need a digital, digital Hippocratic oath, which literally means that "do no harm," and so, um, and you don't need a company to sort of assert that. Uh, what has happened is that we anything that's free is not free. Your product um, in 2012, Eric Schmidt of then Google basically said, "We will know your thoughts before you do." And um, Facebook has also uh, acquired a company which, on the surface, has uh, fairly positive intentions. That is to use your brain to actually move limbs. But some uh, people are suggesting, would that be a, a step toward telepathy? And so then you could ask, yes, the question, is privacy going to be dead at that point? Um, the, the, the thing of it is trust has been broken. And uh, these, these companies, uh, what we have to now look at is these companies are actually, unfortunately, we're not talking about compliance anymore to privacy. Uh, that is a legal, legal language because they're, they're ready to pay. They, they can pay. Uh, this is more about principle and ethics. And so we need more ethics in, involved in the discussion. And uh, we need to think about, uh, you know, what a governance model and a trust uh, model can look like in the future. And uh, having, having companies of this nature self-govern has proven to be probably not the accurate, not the uh, positive way to go. But on the other hand, you have to work with people, to, uh, especially uh, government officials, to look at what are the regulatory um, technology mechanisms that could be triggered to actually uh, in, in, instill a governance model um, at a legal level. I want to talk about the regulatory level in a, in a minute. Okay. Uh, before that, I would like to talk about the broken trust that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Where did that actually happen? Where did we lose the trust in the past? Was there a specific event. For example, uh, there was also a big data breach that you were also personally affected. Sure. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can talk about so that when we lost the trust. Every day is a breach. So you just pick <laughs> it up. I mean, and it's picking up more and more. So, And uh, I think we live in a bubble uh, right at this point in time because we're so used to it. And uh, we don't have the outcry of, of people who are involved, you know, who are, are, are victims themselves or people in general, as you, as we do, for example, with caring about our climate, which we always, we have to care about. Be, but until things are, are, are very, very obvious that we're living in this particular situation, you're going to see, I think we will see that more and more. So in my personal case, um, 
there was a breach, uh, one of the largest, it was the largest breach in, in Swiss, Switzerland's history, I think, known, which is, I think, about February 9, 2018, uh, where Swisscom, Swisscom had, um, had, had its data, had leaked its data by accident to one of its third parties. I think it manages quite a bit of uh, third party com partners, 1,500. And that meant that 80,000 citizens were affected. So 80,000. And I was one of them. Massive. So I received uh, an SMS informing me of the fact that I was affected. Well, first and foremost, should I trust the source of that uh, SMS? I'm not sure. Right. And secondly, it was basically go to this particular page and um, everything will be, you know, you, you look at how, how the treatment of your data would be and so on and so forth. The thing of it is, is that what was, what was probably known? Well, probably my phone number and my name. That's, pro that's a lot of data already. Mm -hmm. And I will suggest that uh, we will not know the ramifications of that breach until um, until later, and that is because data gets sold into the un un you know the dark world, and so uh, for me the trust was lost. It was not enough that the CEO, to his credit, went on television to say he was also affected. It was the fact that the company in this particular case, Wiscom, never came back to me and said, "Oh, we lost your trust today," or the eighty thousand people, "We lost your trust today." Uh, Either we're going to give you a three-month rebate, or not that that I, I, you know, that would be great if it, that happened, but it wasn't. It was sort of that that there was this arrogance that uh, we, we, you know, I witnessed and experienced, and that and there was no uh, question to me about we or an assertion that we lost your trust today. How can we get it back to you? And the reasoning I think is because they're a big element in this in the market. And so, uh, you know, what's happening is that uh, they know that it's very difficult for uh, customers to switch uh, providers, or if they switch providers, you know, you constantly are switching a provider. Mm -hmm. What is the provider providing you at the time? So they, they are an incumbent. Incumbents must be held particularly to a higher standard. And when you lose your trust, spe specifically when there is a, a portion of the government looking at that, uh, there has to be a remediation. So we see an, an, um, an equivalent of that with the Swiss Rail. For example, Swiss Rail now is trying to work on coming in on time, uh, addressing the on-time issues, even looking at how they can do uh, payment schemes back to, uh, to passengers and so on. That's a step forward. The real step to address here is to make sure that you're never late. Uh, in a country where punctuality has always been part of the culture. Mm -hmm. And um, so we, we need to, you know, keep inside of our tenants and our principles. So taking this Swisscom breach as an example, uh, from your perspective, mm -hmm. are we also uh, like always running into the danger of facing data breaches and exposing our personal data for as long as we don't fully control it ourselves with the self-sovereign identity model? So, so here's the thing. Once you're out there, whether you're using any form of social media, whatever that looks like, uh, you know, whatever uh, favorite internet uh, tool that you're using, your, for, your dust is always going to be there. So you can never get that back. And so you have to be very responsible of how much you reveal about yourself on the internet, et cetera. I think that, uh, and it's forever there. It's forever there. So, you know, you have to be careful about um, how you're presenting yourself on the on the Internet itself. Maybe a quick follow up question here. What would be your recommendation? How be responsible? I mean, look, um, if you drive a car in order for you to have a license, you have to go through all kinds of tests. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost the equivalent here in Switzerland of having a mechanical engineering degree. However, uh, when you go buy a phone or when you go buy a, a, an ob, uh, a smart uh, tablet or whatever uh, that you're using that it has linkage to the internet, who is actually uh, providing you uh, information about your privacy, um, how to, to do, how to use fundamentals, hygienics, on uh, keeping your privacy knob, uh, knobs secure and so on and so forth. No, very, very few people do that. And so we need to, as an industry, come together and actually inform citizens how they can use their, you know, how privacy can be um, at a hygienic, uh, fundamental level 
uh, sec secured. And so we need to be uh, doing that, whether you're buying a phone or smartphone or whatever that looks like, or a tablet, uh, that has to be uh, very, very, very key. Because without that, what happens is we get uh, a whole, all kinds of breaches and we have to be uh, responsible as an industry. And who should be in charge of actually executing that? All of us. I mean, um, so for, for example, the people who are selling the technology itself, selling objects that get connected to the internet, the service providers, everybody has to, uh, to be responsible. Even the technology that you develop um, as a whole, you have to be responsible to say, this is, these are, these are how, this, these are the areas where your privacy could be affected. And I'm not talking about 20 pages or 30 pages of legal documents. Because uh, citizens need, you know, their attention span, people's attention span or can be in general, um, very, very impaired when they have to go through reams and reams of tech, uh, uh, legal documents. It has to be very simple. It has to be readable. And uh, people have to be to understand, you know, this is how your data is going to be used. And by the way, you cannot hold their feet up and say, we, we're not going to give you a service unless you actually sign this, this, and this papers. What has to be is, is in reverse. Um, here are some security, basic privacy issue, uh, uh, issues or uh, actions that you can take. And number number one, number two is we we do use your data in such a way, but if you don't want that uh, done, I mean, if you don't want any, for example, any advertisements sent to you and so on and so forth, please let us know. But it has to be much more transparent and much more, um, you know, readable and much more consumable by uh, the person on the street. And then sort of giving the link back to the Vetri Foundation mm -hmm. and, and your solution, your platform, basically, you would then have everything in one place that you as a user could actually determine well, how you access that. So, so we don't hold data. So full stop. That's important for you to know. We don't hold data, nor uh, we cannot be seen holding data. So that frictionless exchange, even though it could be on a, you know, a laptop or via a phone, happens uh, with with the app. Happens between the data consumer owner and the uh, or the the data consumer and the data owner. That is between perhaps an enterprise uh, and or the the owner of that data. So that's important and. Uh, what happens as a result, you're getting, because of your attention being interrupted, you know, or, or you choosing that your attention is interrupted, you're actually uh, receiving valid tokens as a result of that. So that is how you are being re uh, paid. Fantastic. And how would you rate the current awareness of, you know, the, the data problems or the issues about how people handle their data? Because some people seem to be very aware of that and also very careful but the majority still doesn't really seem to be too much aware of the problem despite the many data breaches that we've I, I agree uh, to the latter. I think, um, I think um, the, to the uh, average consumer who's on the internet, it's not well known. I think it's incumbent upon all of us to actually educate the, the consumer. I do think, uh, especially when we're talking about people learning to code and so on and so forth, we should actually have um, that privacy discussion as part of that education and ethics ethics discussion as a part of that education. And also looking at what we do for uh, software engineers when they're developing technologies too, to, to make sure that they're, you know, they are very intentional about what, what the purpose of the technology is as they develop it. You also talked about uh, basically the role of the government or the regulators. In what way can they actually, or do at the moment, support or oppose your project? Um, I mean, I think, I think. Uh, so, what the, what is there not to love about venturing is really basically what I always counter with such a with with a comment. Uh, no, they look. Uh, the regulators are very. Cons they need to understand what it is they're regulating, and this is what we get into reg tech. Uh, clearly by articles of the constitution of your country of, of a country or articles of GDPR, for example, you know, general data regulation, um, privacy regulation in, in Europe, uh, clearly there are legal ramifications when you're not, uh, when your data is being leaked. There are legal ramifications. Having said that, uh, I think what they're now more concerned about is what is it they're going to regulate and how. And so what, this gets into regular tech regulations, which means that a regulator is going to have to have certain skill sets. I mean, when you vote, 
you don't vote on a person to have a skill set. You vote on a person because of what platform they stand for. Mm -hmm. But I do see that there's going to be an intersectionality between understanding law, political science, and computer science to look at issues around, which is the type of research that the group I'm associated with in, at Humboldt Internet uh, Institute and Society in Berlin, which is around um, computer algorithms and um, and, and human rights, you know, and, and that type of thing. You, you have to l understand what can go wrong. And so um, I think that that is a very, very important issue. But to the credit of Switzerland, mm -hmm. uh, September, this past uh, September in 2019, Switzerland on Swiss, you know, digital days actually announced, if, I if I'm correct, uh, the establishment of a uh, digital ethics um, group or organization or, uh, or competency center to be based in Geneva. And so that means that because they need to understand that's what, where you can have regulators part of that discussion, where you can have universities, uh, people who are from the private industry to look at um, how, what could possibly go wrong, but also understand the uh, implications to the citizens. So that's a step toward rec, uh, rec tech. So there's still a long way to go, but we're moving in the right direction. Well, there's still, so everybody says there's a long way to go, but I think uh, everything is moving so fast and we need a, a middle way. Uh, I think that's one thing. And I think we're seeing more of that also at the European Union level um, to some extent. And uh, I think what you're, what you're now seeing is now a generation of folks coming up, especially for policymakers, mm -hmm. caring about this deeply and being able to ask the very intelligent questions about what are you doing with the privacy? Mm -hmm. How are the citizens informed? Um, what, what about these breaches? You know, what about the ransomware that's going on here? Uh, how do we remediate that? And, and so on and so forth. These are great questions to ask. And that gets into security, privacy, and, and data ownership. So here in Switzerland, you seem to have a, a good sort of network of, of smart people working on, on these questions and, and problems. So just out of curiosity, why is Switzerland the right place uh, for the Vetri Foundation? Well, and yeah, that's a great versus what, Libra and Calibra? Uh, so, um, and no offense, no offense to that. I mean, um, not at all, because I think that that announcement was interesting. And so far, it actually stimulates the discussions that we're having today. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, uh, because of, first and foremost, uh, the brand itself, when you think about uh, Switzerland, there's the neutrality brand, there's the brand of quality. Um, certainly, we don't want to continue to taint that brand. Uh, that's important. And plus, the government is very, government and the ecosystem are very keen to have this level of experimentation. Uh, there are other countries, yeah, there's Singapore, uh, there's Estonia, there are other countries that are along this along this path, but I think Switzerland has, uh, you know, the, to be proud of its brand. And, and we think that when I think of a Swiss brand, I think of Swiss quality, and I think of that. Uh, and when we misstep, and, and as, a, as an industry, uh, nobody um, beats themselves up for more than, than a Swiss citizen or a Swiss business person, typically. And I think uh, there are exceptions, but typically, and I think that's a uh, you know, holding to these ten tenets of, of, of being correct and being transparent is very important. And on the other hand, what is still missing or what would you like to have changed? Um, oh, what, well, I think going faster is to one, one of your, <laughs> so going, no, I wouldn't say just going faster. I think uh, we're on a good path. It's about building the ecosystem. I would like to see, uh, to be very prescriptive, more industry rallying around standardizing this whole notion of fair data or fair treatment of data. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really, really important. Um, you know, I'd like to see companies do that and not just because it is uh, a thing to, to, to say. I think it's because you need to show how you're doing that and be demonstrable uh, uh, in that case. We need, need to look at what the KPIs are. Uh, we need to look at, um, you know, making sure that we do have everybody involved, whether they're universities or NGOs and so on, civil civil groups, and um, nonprofits to actually rally around that. That's what I think needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great call to action to anybody who thinks, hey, I want to have this conversation about fair data. Please get in touch with Monique. Sure. So in uh, early January 2019, you also founded the Vetri Foundation. So you're now officially uh, active as a foundation from a legal perspective. 
And I wonder just what are the next steps? What's the roadmap? What are your future plans with the foundation? So I didn't found the Vetri Foundation. Um, the Vetri Foundation, I'm president of the Vetri Foundation. So the Vetri Foundation was uh, established in uh, 2018, um, thereabouts, right? Yeah, December. And then 2019, we're, we're active. So I'm now president of the foundation. We had to take all of these articles and everything put ourselves together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at uh, right now uh, completing our, um, our, our product and, and making it wider for wider use. Uh, we're working with the communities. We're building our ecosystem, uh, per se. I think that's very, very important. We've taken some of the steps. We're moving more toward that. We'd like to see a wider adoption eventually of, of the application itself. Uh, it's very, very key. So uh, those are the steps we've been taking uh, and, uh, you know, wrapping a governance model uh, on it. I mean, if we have on the foundation uh, a lawyer, so that's really, I mean, we couldn't do it without a lawyer. And we have a member from uh, Procevis who came over because that's continuation of a little bit of the, of the culture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that's made us um, a fairly independent uh, community. Is there a rough estimation about when the first users will actually be able to, to use the platform? Well, some of the users are actually starting to come on to the platform. So we're hoping that, you know, we're starting to, you know, get beyond sort of uh, what we'll call a, a pro, uh, an MVP type of mm -hmm. a model to actually getting into wide adoption um, for, for, for the community and for, for uh, the industry overall. So we hope, uh, I mean, that is targeted 2019 on to 2020 as we bridge into 2020 that we could see that uh, wider adoption. Great. So in order to conclude the episode, I prepared some uh, rapid fire questions. Rapid fire questions as you do. So basically, I give you a choice of two or three options and you basically have to choose one of them and quickly in one sentence explain why you made this choice. Okay. Are you ready? One sentence. Okay. So the first one, humans or artificial intelligence? Humans. Why? Because um, um, artificial intelligence are created by, uh, by humans and uh, the whole s notion is what could go possibly go wrong and things can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Next one, privacy or sharing? Privacy. And the reason is that um, um, it, it is related to sharing because you can selectively disclose. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Comfort zone or risk-taking? Risk-taking, absolutely. Always? Always. You well, will be thrown off the cliff if you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wealth or happiness? I would say, um, I would say happiness. Uh, you can be wealthy uh, and be very unhappy and be very ill. And uh, the thing about wealth is that you always want more. And the last one, you recently became Swiss citizen. Mm -hmm. So this will be a tough choice, Switzerland or the United States. I'm in a new chapter, so it's Switzerland. Sounds great. Monique, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, and I wish you all the best for the future with the Vetri Foundation. Thank you, Silvan. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed the content, we would be thrilled to receive your rating on Apple Podcasts. That way you not only support Swisspreneur, but also help other entrepreneurs discovering the show and finding more valuable information on how to run their businesses. Next week, we will already be back with an all new episode of the Swisspreneur Show. So we hope to see you again then for a new episode.